All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the production of subject contrast, which I have called Hello X-Ray. That's the way that's supposed to be pronounced there, so just in case there's any confusion. Hello X-Ray. You know that feeling. All right, so we're going to define subject contrast, which we've already kind of alluded to being something about differential absorption, attenuation, whatever you want to call it. We'll talk about the effects of, this should sound familiar, tissue thickness, physical density, and atomic number. That's exactly what we were just talking about this morning, right? So there's some nice mesh there between this and CT. And in fact, the way that we're gonna view this data in X-ray is pretty much the same as the way we'll view it in CT. Um, as it relates to subject contrast and the remnant beam, we'll define the remnant beam real carefully. We'll illustrate, we'll illustrate the effects of scatter radiation on subject contrast in the remnant beam, but let's go ahead and take a wild and crazy guess. Someone I haven't heard from today. Who guesses that scatter is going to be a good thing for contrast? Who guesses it's not going to be a good thing? The knots have got it. Scatter <coughs> makes contrast bad. Um, exactly. Yep, that's the term that we'll use for it. it uh, sets down a yeah a blanket of fog on the image or noise um, we'll talk about the effects of increasing kvp on the predominance of compton over photoelectric effect and that's where stuff's gonna get weird so you don't want to fall asleep there because stuff gets really wacky when we start talking about kvp and then finally we'll describe the effects of increasing atomic number on contrast like contrast agents and stuff on photoelectric and compton effect so in thinking about subject contrast, this is produced by differential absorption, right? So quick anatomy of how this system works. We've got a remnant x-ray beam that's exiting the patient, right? So we have the primary beam incident on the patient's skin. Portion of it is absorbed through photoelectric. Some of it's scattered from the Compton effect in ways other than what's going to be incident on the image receptor. And that remnant amount, right? The uh, ratio, if you will, the divided ratio between what we had and what remained, we're going to call um, that differential absorption, and it is also what can be thought of as subject contrast. Now, we're going to go just a little bit deeper than we went this morning on this, because there's something really magical that's happening right here, right? And this little window right here between the patient and the image receptor, um, we've got the window in which subject contrast exists. That's where subject contrast lives. Um, the reason I'm pointing that out to y'all and saying that is because once this image is processed, contrast is gonna become something different. We're gonna start to refer to it as image contrast. And as you've probably already seen, we can jack with the image contrast, right? We can window, we can level, we can change all sorts of stuff. We can make the whites black and the blacks white. We can switch everything around. So we can jack with the subject, with the image contrast all day long. What we can't mess with is the subject contrast, what lives right in here in that remnant signal. Okay? So when we think about all the photon interactions that happen within the patient, this represents some degree of absorption or attenuation. And when we take what we had and what remains in this little sweet spot here, we have what we call subject contrast. Okay, so I wanna be real clear on that. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, what is contrast? Contrast is everything. Like if, if this was a photography class, right, and I was teaching y'all how to take good pictures, that would be my soapbox. Contrast is everything. Without contrast, you ain't got nothing, right? And we know this. We know this because we use contrast all the time. It's part of how our eyes perceive things, and we use it to help ourselves survive. If we did not see contrast between different things, we'd be running into walls all the time and being eaten by lions, right? That'd be a problem. So you know contrast when you see it. You know without me telling you which one of these pictures has an appropriate amount of contrast, correct? Mm -hmm. You can tell the good one from the bad one. What's interesting about these two pictures is they have the same amount of density. And that's gonna be the hard thing, is being able to train our eyes to see 
which one, not just which one has the best optimum contrast to where I can see what I need to see, but also differentiating between, well, what else changed about these pictures? Nothing, right? The answer is nothing. The, it, the images are roughly the same amount of darkening or brightening, right? And that's a weird one. That's a, that is something that we will spend the next year or so training our eyes to visualize. So it's going to require thought and thinking. You're going to burn some brain cells on this one. I'm just telling you right now. But if I look at the amount of black out here in the tissue and out here on the side, they are equal. If I look at the amount of white, particularly in this area where a lot of absorption happened, they are equal. And so I'm saying they have the same degree of brightness or the same degree of density. Those terms might be used interchangeably. They're just opposite sides of the same coin, right? Density being the amount of darkening on the image, brightness being the amount of white on the image, right? So they have roughly the same amount of exposure. What is different about these images is one has a better subject contrast, the image on our left, okay? Um, so what are some ways that we know it has good contrast? Great, that was a really good discussion. Okay. Well, big picture level, what affects subject contrast? This should look familiar to us because, again, we talked about this in CT. Tissue thickness, tissue density, atomic number. Those are what affect subject contrast. Those are what affect differential absorption vis-a-vis. -vis, those are what affect subject contrast. They affect it differently. So let's look at each one. But it is helpful. I like this image of a barium enema or, or dual contrast study because it shows us all three in a single picture. So we can use our minds to think creatively about this x-ray and see all three of these at work. We can see the distinction in contrast, right? Like if I'm out here where the tissue is less thick on the sides of the patient, I can clearly see the line of that portion of the descending colon, right? Um, versus over here, it's a, yeah, it's busy, but it's also more difficult to say, okay, which of that is, where does the bowel end and where does the spine begin? Right, why? It's thicker. The patient is just thicker there. So I've asked y'all to buy these. Why? We need to know the thickness of things. It impacts making good pictures. Um, tissue density. Um, when we talk about tissue density, we are not talking about thickness. I'm talking about the physical property of the tissue itself. So for example, air is less physically dense, right, than fat. Air is less physically dense than fat, right? So if I had a, a for some reason, if I'm walking around with a bucket full of fat and another bucket full of air, the bucket full of air is going to be less weighty, right? That's what I'm talking about. And the reason I'm making that distinction and belaboring that point is atomic number is a different thing. Atomic number has to do with stuff on the periodic table, right? The Z number of stuff. So like I told you earlier, the Z number of barium is 56. It has a higher atomic number than all this other stuff. So it shows up really clear, right? It shows up really clear. But let's break each one of these down. Tissue thickness is the reason why old school techs love, love, love their calipers, right? And I've yet to hear a cogent reason for why we ever got away from caliper usage. No one uses them, but no one's ever told me why did we stop using them. I was trained to use them, everyone was trained to use them, and we all stopped. I don't know why. I think we were just, I don't know. Seemed awkward or what? I don't know. I mean, we're totally okay with asking chicks if they're pregnant, but we're not okay with putting a caliper on them to, so that we can reduce their dose. That just seems gonzo to me. So what I've asked is for us to rethink the caliper. Maybe the caliper, maybe there is something weird about the caliper and it gets in our way, and it actually could be a barrier to, to efficient patient care. Maybe there's an infectious concern there. Maybe whatever, right? I've asked us to start thinking about this something that we can keep in our pocket or similar to our mark marker that we can quickly roll it out, make a measurement, and know, okay, that's what my mass needs to be. That's what my KVP needs to be. So measuring 
tissue thickness has this impact on subject contrast. As tissue increases, as this thickness increases, attenuation increases. As thickness increases, attenuation increases. A quick rule of thumb, for every 4 cm increase in thickness, attenuation doubles. So if I have my measuring tape and I'm out on portables, and I know that the portable machine, the techniques that are generally set for the portable, like AP chest, right? Um, they're in this ballpark range for mass. And I roll into a patient's room and they're significantly larger than my normal patient. If I know what my normal patient's uh, separation is or the measurement from this point where the central ray is going to enter to this point where the central ray is going to exit, then I know what my mass should be. I don't have to sit around and guess. I don't have to fudge with the machine at all. Just for every 4 cm increase, I need to double my mass. Right? So it's a very helpful rule of thumb. Is it going to be on the test? No. I'm not interested. In, if it says rule of thumb, I'm not interested in testing you on it. It's a rule of thumb. It's not going to be on the registry. Where are you going to see it every single day of your career? It's the thing that makes a difference between a good, uh, okay tech and a pro. It's these kind of rules of thumb. Yes? All right, so what's the normal ribbon basing when you add four centimeters? What's the normal thickness? It would be different for each, for each body part, but he has a table later on in the book and he'll tell you what approximate normals are. And so you, a, lot of, um, a lot of times we used to even have um, technique charts posted with normal thicknesses. You'll get, an, you'll get an idea of what normal That's thickness like is. Anatomical per perfection or something? Or? It doesn't have to be. This is really an approximation tool. So, I mean, one thing you can do is measure yourself, right? Because uh, if, if you're fairly close to normal, you know you're fairly close to normal, okay, what is my measurement? All right? they're, they're this much more different than me, right? If I know the techniques for myself, I can guess what they are for other people. All right. Um, this says it's variably related. See the text for an example. Let me pause this. But again, the primary way that we're going to utilize this way of thinking is going to be with measurements of part thickness. Tissue density. So I'm changing now. I included a lung x-ray here or a chest x-ray here because this is such a great example of differences in physical density. Physical density can be defined as the amount of mass concentrated per volume of space. Some example of that would be grams per centimeter. Beam attenuation is directly proportional to tissue density. So the lungs have less density. There's more air in the lungs. There's less stuff in the lungs per volume space, right? Um, therefore, more stuff's going to pass through the lungs. Kind of common sense. The bones are more dense. They are physically dense. There's this weird lattice of calcium that holds bones together. They're more physically dense, therefore they're going to stop more x-rays. When I look at the lungs and the bones on a chest x-ray, I can clearly see a lot of contrast between the two. Why? Because of that difference in tissue density. So this is about the prettiest chest x-ray picture I could find. If you want an idea of what should what is an ideal chest x-ray, this is close to it. The one thing, can anyone guess what the one thing is that they failed to do? Marker. Marker, okay, what else? Yeah. Two things. Scapulas. They forgot to ask the patient to roll their shoulders forward. Everything else looks great. Good work. So, um, extreme differences in physical density result in a high subject contrast. When I'm looking at that remnant beam, what's exiting the patient, the signal is going to have a high degree of subject contrast because of the high extreme difference in physical density between, for example, the lungs and the bones. Atomic number, Z number. So each atom has more electrons uh, packed into its shell. As we increase atomic number, we've got more electrons, therefore we've got more stuff we can ionize, therefore we've got more stuff that can stop x-rays. Right? So increasing atomic number in certain structures will increase the amount of attenuation, which is also increasing that differential absorption, which should, by extension, be changing the subject contrast. So um, if we look at iodine and barium versus hydrogen and oxygen, why did I choose hydrogen and oxygen? 
because they comprise water molecules, which are the main thing that your body is composed of. So if I look at iodine and barium versus everything else your body is composed of, there's a significant difference in these numbers. Therefore, this would be a high contrast difference. That's why we use iodine contrast in barium. Um, beam attenuation increases exponentially with increased atomic number. I'll say that again. It increases exponentially. The others we said were like directly proportional and stuff like that. This is an exponential proportion. Exponential. Okay. Um, it offers another example of bones. So bones are both physically dense, more dense than soft tissue, but um, it's also about 20 times more absorbent due to its increased atomic number, right? Its increased atomic number is really what sets the stage for it being so much more of an attenuator. So I've marked out my idiot's guide to subject contrast, right? If I was going to break down the world of x-ray to just what it is it's on the simplest terms. Penetrating x-rays makes the image black. Photoelectric makes stuff white. Compton makes noise. And I'll say it once, I'll say it again. The point isn't high contrast or low contrast, it's optimum contrast. Do I have sufficient contrast to see the nails sticking in this individual's head? Yes, I do. Okay, next patient. Right? Versus something like this, which is a piece of crap x-ray. Right? This is the kind of stuff you get thrown out of x-ray school for making. Why? Because there is no contrast here. We can all see it, right? It's like we're walking in a fog and we met this weird pelvis or something. What a terrible person to make a picture. I'm sorry. All right. Scatter kills subject contrast. If you want to know how to get rid of subject contrast, the very first thing you should go to is go talk to Compton because it destroys subject contrast. It's completely random. It happens in every possible direction, right? And so it is literally the x-ray equivalent of having to drive down the road listening to radio static over your favorite song, right? Um, so we call that the blanket of fog or noise. As scatter increases, subject contrasts decreases. They are inversely proportional. As scatter increases, subject contrast decreases. So anything that causes an increase in scatter causes a decrease in subject contrast. Okay, and there's clearly a verb missing in this question. Okay, great. All right, let's talk about KVP, and this is the one that's, that's really weird. That's why I've included um, some Spanish in here, so maybe just the two languages will cause an effrigion in our brains um, to make this make sense. Photoelectric effect is inversely proportional to the cube of KVP, right? If I were to say that in clear English, I would say, I. No mas blanques in tu radiografia. What am I saying? I'm saying, oh my gosh, there is no white in the x-ray. Right? Oh my goodness, I just got rid of all the white in the x-ray. Right? So that's a problem. If there's no photoelectric effect, there's no whitening on the image. There's just noise. Okay? Compton effect is only slightly affected by KVP. We'll be looking at this graphically in just a moment. And what this says is, pero no hay más ruido, which, which is saying, but there's still plenty of noise. So no whites, but I've still got plenty of noise on this picture. Okay? But as KVP increases, and this is the part where I really want you all to pay attention. As well, KVP... Again. Yeah. So I said that if, if KVP increases, photoelectric effect is decreasing. Decrease. No more whites on my picture. Right? But Compton effect is still in effect. No one else to say that. So there's still plenty of noise. There's still plenty of noise. And as KVP increases, Compton effect becomes the predominant interaction. Compton effect becomes the predominant interaction. Bookmark that. You'll, I'm going to show you what that looks like graphically and just um, what that looks like. But I said earlier, Hello, X-ray, right? This says, adios, contraste, which means goodbye, contrast. 
If you do not have any white, and what you mostly have is gray, you no longer have contrast, right? And you've effectively killed the patient, right? If we're honest, if this is guiding treatments and surgeries and things like that, and we're detecting cancer, et cetera, et cetera, if I can't see what I need to see, I've effectively killed the patient at this point, right? So, I don't cuss often, or I try not to. Maybe I cuss more than I should. But the question is, like, what the heck? Like, to increase subject contrast, you decrease KVP? The answer is yes. To increase subject contrast, you decrease KVP. I will say that over and over and over again. It is one of the most counterintuitive things about x-ray. If I want to increase subject contrast, I will decrease KVP. So let's look at it slightly different direction. This is what I'm talking about graphically, right? This is a really helpful graphic. I love this image. This is, this is it in a nutshell. If you understand this picture, you're getting this, and you're well on your way to, to taking really pretty pictures. What this is showing is I've got these two lines here. One of them is tissue photoelectric effect. The other one is bone photoelectric effect. These two are photoelectric effect, right? This one here is bone Compton scattering, and that one is uh, tissue Compton scattering. So this graphic tells us a ton of information, right? It tells us that for differences in physical density, right? Let me rewind that. For differences in atomic number, Compton effect wasn't affected. It doesn't care if it's looking at a bone or soft tissue. It's going to scatter. It doesn't care. Right? Photoelectric effect does care. We see, a dis we see distinct differences between these two lines due to that di difference in atomic number and dif difference in physical density. So photoelectric effect does care. This part of the graph right here is saying the overall um, amount of attenuation for that effect. This right here is saying the overall kiloelectron volt of the x-rays, okay? As the kilo electron volt increases, what happens to um, photoelectric effect? It decreases. it decreases until we get to 140, it's gone. This is the diagnostic range of energies. When I was talking earlier about what is the diagnostic range of energies, this graph tells us it's roughly 20 keV to somewhere just over 120 keV. EV. If you look at any x-ray machine, it's the range of energy you can actually set KVPs for. That's the diagnostic range of energies. Why? Because in that range of energies is the sweet spot for photoelectric effect. Right? So we've established that. The next thing is to talk about, though, what did you just say about like KVP as it decreases, subject contrast increases? Well, yes, this graphic tells us that as well. As I start to turn my KVP down, what happened to the predominance of photoelectric effect over Compton? It increased, right? It, it crossed the line in the sweet spot right around here, and we now have a predominance of photoelectric effect versus Compton effect. We have a predominance of photoelectric effect <coughs> over and above Compton effect. Compton effect's not changing all that much. But what, what's different is which one's on top, right? Percentage-wise, which one is more? So at this energy, percentage-wise, Compton effect is more. At this energy, percentage-wise, Compton effect is less. Now, it would be nice if we could just jack with KVP, and that's how we get pretty pictures. I wish that was the whole of the story. Of course it's not. That's why there's two years of this jump, right? There's other things that are factors that are going to influence us. We've already alluded to some of them, right? We need sufficient KVP to get through the patient, right? But we need not too much KVP because then all we're getting through the patient with is with scatter, right? So this is really where we earn the big bucks, is making those determinations. How much KVP is sufficient to penetrate through all the tissue there in the patient, 
while at the same time not just turning my image into a complete bunch of noise. Yes? Can you go back a slide? Yeah, sure. So. Okay, one of the first tools that I will give you in your toolbox. So you're probably already starting to think of, okay, this KVP thing is weird, right? That's weird and annoying. Um, I wish that the physical universe didn't operate this way, um, but it does. So what are the tools that we have in our bag that can help us fight this stuff and find the illnesses that we're looking to help them detect? The first friend that I will mention is like contrast. So there's a difference between contrast agents and subject contrast, but they both are friends, right? As I increase the amount of contrast in the patient's body, I'm increasing the amount of differential absorption, right? So what I'm saying is the x-rays got sneaky on us. They're doing weird stuff with the KVP and everything, and that's really annoying. But let's try to out-sneak them, right? Um, uh, not just by lowering KVP to increase contrast, but also potentially by increasing atomic number. So we've got another card up our sleeve, right? So IV and oral contrast are that extra card up our sleeve. We're going to be filling up our toolbox with these kinds of things throughout the trimester, right? Finding tools to win, help us win the fight with, against noise and to get better pictures, okay? The first one I'm going to mention, the most obvious one, is actual contrast agents. If I want to enhance subject contrast, give the patient some contrast. Right? It's kind of a no-brainer. So what I'm saying is like the greatest number of photoelectric interactions happens with a low KVP and a high Z number in the tissue. That's going to give you a really high contrast. Low KVP, high Z number. Okay. Final thing I want to mention is just within our textbook, these summary portions of the chapter are quite, are quite helpful. So if you're wondering um, what parts of it are, are good, um, pretty much anything in the summary part is great. I don't normally look at it while I'm making my PowerPoints, but I use this to like look at my PowerPoints and say, okay, yeah, I think I've done a good job covering everything that needs to be covered. Um, so I'll just recap a little bit here. All interactions attenuate the x-ray beam and thus contribute to the production of subject contrast, okay? So it doesn't matter if it's Compton effect, photoelectric effect, all those things can potentially contribute to subject contrast. Whether that's a good contribution or a bad one is like, like we've determined uh, subject to some debate. Subject contrast is defined then as that ratio of x-ray attenuation between two adjacent structures, right? It's the same way of saying whether or not it's got that edge definition. Uh, Ms. Thorne is correct. Edge definition is probably best thought of as sharpness, but it, to me it's kind of the saying the same thing to say, can I see that that's bone and that soft tissue to adjacent structures? Yeah. Um, uh, for, for thicker tissues, x-ray attenuation increases exponentially, approximately doubling for every four to five centimeters. There's that rule of thumb. It's helpful for us. If I know that attenuation is increasing at, as the part gets more thick, I can set my technique to compensate for that. There's things I can do like increase the mass to compensate for that. Um, X-ray attenuation increases in direct proportion to the physical density of the tissue. We talked about that with bones versus lungs. X-ray attenuation increases by the cube um, of the atomic number. So I've said that atomic number, Z number, is exponentially related to contrast increases. Um, we've talked about the blanket of noise or scatter. There's other things that can kind of impact our image, but the main one uh, is Compton effect. Um, and there's a number of tools that we're going to use to clean that up. Mr. Wolf was talking about one of them right here. Right, so that's yet another tool that we're going to use to clean up scatter. Um, so because of all the above, a higher KVP, the light densities in the image are lost at the image receptor. This represents a loss of subject contrast. The use of lower KVPs restores subject contrast. Right. So all of those, I think, are really helpful. I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with that. A lot of my test questions come from that, right? A lot of the way I think about it comes from that. 
Is it kind of the digested down version? Yeah, it is. So we're going to still want to make sure we understand everything the chapter is saying. 